So welcome to the webinar. We're going to kick off this webinar today is how to create connection, crafting the right story. Peter, you've got a PowerPoint. Why don't you pull that up? I'll do that. Actually, before I pull up the PowerPoint, I want to do a brief thank you to these guys for hey, that's putting us. on this webinar. There you go. And I love the graphic. There you that go. Looks good, so, Peter. All right. With that's that, a good look. Isn't that a good look? It is. All right. With that, let's go over to uh, to PowerPoint. Can you all see my mouse in the upper left hand corner of the screen? If you are, type rodent or mouse or something. I'm sure, this is working. <laughs> we can see it, Peter. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Eek. Perfect. Thanks, Dwayne. I like and that. Bottom right hand corner. Give me a bottom or right mouse. Thanks, Paige. All right. With that, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, I love to share this. Just go ahead and uh, read this. Let me know when you're done. <laughs> folks yeah this is my this is my life this is what i always think <laughs> all right um i want to do a rim shot thanks andrew i want to do a little bit of a kickoff and then we're going to dive into a lot of back and forth here uh the kickoff is as follows um nick would you read this story out loud please i would love totally, to. by the way the folks this is totally unrehearsed so okay let's see how good i am at reading you're riding a bicycle rather fast. You skid on some gravel and fall, scraping your legs and arms. You're bleeding moderately and you hurt, but your bike seems to be okay. Someone sees the fall and offers to help. He offers you water, but you aren't thirsty, you're bleeding. He offers you a patch kit for the bike, but your tires are fine, you're still bleeding. Now, not only are you hurt, but you're also irritated. He offers you food, music, asthma medicine, tents and girls and guys, a new chain, a map, handlebars, bicycle bags, even a smartphone. All those are very nice offers, but clearly what you need is a few bandages and a couple of aspirin. I see what right, you so did there, Mr. Cohen. There you go. Well, you don't be, but wait, there will be more. All right, audience, what is the point behind this story? Type it in your chat dialog box. What's the lesson? What's the takeaway message behind this little story? This goof. By the way, first of all, thunderous round of applause for that impassioned reading. Everybody give them a clap, clap, clap. Missing a mark. Thank you, Michael. Anything else? Anyone else? Missing a mark? So there's the claps. All right. How many of you, yeah, ignoring customer needs, not addressing the pain, how many of you- the literal would, pain. Yeah, the literal pain in this case. How many of you would say, this sounds like a lot of demos we have all seen? Everybody type, and how, in your chat dialogue box. All right, the moral of this story is what? Everybody read up here the title of the slide. It is the specific capabilities that somebody needs to solve their problems not all this other stuff that might be in your offering. That's the moral. Now we're gonna, well, I'm just gonna leave it at that for now. With one or two more lead-ins, <clears throat> and then we're gonna dive in some, some real stories. So question, um, let me actually ask this in the form of the question. Um, Nick, how did you get to where you are today? I mean, physically this, this morning. <laughs> I woke up and got out of bed. Yeah, I'm still at home. <laughs> okay, oh, you're still at home, okay. But I, um, I drove my daughter somewhere, so I did get out in the car and I drove this morning. Okay, where, where did you drive your daughter? I drove her to her mom's house, actually. Okay. So I can do this webinar with you in silence. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much, so in silence. Um, what do you remember from that drive? Uh, a brief conversation I had with my daughter, that's about it. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, just as the slide says here, we are programmed as humans, we are programmed to forget. We very rapidly process an enormous amount of intake information. Um, think about this, Nick's driving along, he's processing the cars, the trees, the other uh, the buildings he's going by, and most of it is identified as not important and is discarded, it is thrown away. Is absolutely thrown away. Why? Because we only remember the things that are threatening, humorous, or sexually charged. That's about it. That's about it. So what else do you remember from that drive, Nick? Anything else? The conversation you had with your daughter? Conversation I had with my daughter. I, I can, I mean, I'm playing it back in my head. It's a, it's a room yeah. I drive regularly. So I can think of Actually, I don't know if I'm remembering what I actually saw this morning or if I'm remembering from previous journeys, frankly. 
Well, think about, okay, so think about previous journeys. What did you remember from some of those trips? Actually, you know what I remember today? My daughter and I noted there was a lot of people out running today in the Phoenix heat, which is okay. crazy. So we so, did notice that, a lot of people out running. And the point here is that what we forget is everything that is mundane, blah, blah, blah. What we, what we remember are the things that are exceptional, threatening, sexually charged, or humorous. Look, there's a pink cow out in the field. Okay, that we remember. This is what we are battling, ladies and gentlemen, when we were presenting demos to our prospects and customers. Everybody say, aha, because uh -huh. this should be a little, yeah, this should be a little moment of, uh, of, of, <laughs> of elucidation, if you will. All right, we're going to get into Peter, the content. Peter, just as we get into wrapping uh, the story around your demo, just a reminder to all the participants, if you would like to ask a question, go ahead, put it in the Q&A. Uh, you're also welcome to chat. Make sure you're doing it to everyone, not to hosts and panelists. But don't be shy if you have questions. We're happy to have you hijack this webinar to suit your needs. So, Peter, let's start talking about wrapping a story around your demo. And I think you and I have had this discussion quite a few times. Um, you know, how do you do that? Because, frankly, most of the demos that you and I talk about are pretty boring. This is, this is one of the biggest challenges. Um, many, many, many senior managers say, I need you to wrap a story around your demo. You gotta, gotta have a framework. You gotta make it compelling. Sadly, this is one of the single biggest challenges because it is difficult to actually find a compelling story uh, to wrap your demo inside of. Um, one of the biggest is um, that people are, are often asked to use is, Day in a life. All right. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, uh, why don't you wrap a day in a life or turn your demo into a day in a life or have been asked to do it? Type it in your chat dialog box. I'm curious to see how many folks have been asked to do this. Oh, yes. Okay. And what is, has typically been the, hi, Dan, what has typically been the reaction from the audience? I'm just curious. What do they think about the day in the life? They find it boring. Peter, they find it boring. <laughs> Oy vey. Thank you. Yeah, Brent exactly. nailed it. Yeah. So here's here's a day in a life. Go ahead, uh, Nick, and just, just read through some of these. I got up, brushed my teeth. I actually skipped breakfast today. Went to work, answered emails, uh, jumped on a webinar with Peter Cohen, worked on a project, emailed some more, worked on more on a project, went to another meeting, jumped on another call with Peter Cohen because him and I are friends now. <laughs> and the problem is it's definitely, it's a narrative. But is it, a good, is it a good story? No, it's what it's doing is it's providing structure. So you know where you are, you know where you're going, you are right there. <laughs> um, but it's not engaging, it's not interesting. And that's one of the biggest challenges with the wrap a story around your demo uh, type of a concept. So there's another mode here that I've often seen in terms of Hold trying on, to wrap a story Peter. around your demo. Yeah, go Peter, ahead. What's the hat? What's the hat dance, buddy? What's the what's hat dance? Ball? How many of you, by the way, this this image, how many of you are finding yourself going back and forth with your eyes to their eyes? I don't know about you, but I'm stuck doing that. Um, how many of you have ever participated in, seen a demo or heard of a demo where uh, the vendor physically actually traded hats and say, now I'm John, the manager. Now I'm Bob in accounting, et cetera. How many of you have ever seen this? It's called the hat dance. Yeah, Bruce has seen it. Yep, and you've done it. And it's fun because it is a little bit different in engaging. However, the question you have to ask is, was it any more effective in terms of communicating your message than anything else? And I'm, I'm just gonna leave that as a rhetorical question. Again, it's a framework. Stories can be used in different ways. And that's what we want to dive into in this webinar. So here's a, a few additional ideas. Facts. Let me make sure I'm looking at the right thing. Yeah, because, facts. You know, Peter, we're wired for stories as a civilization. Like if, you, if you've read the book Sapiens, you know, we, our history ah. exists because we're telling stories, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so facts are boring. <clears throat> on the other hand, whoopsie. On the other hand, what's, what's better than facts? Nick, any ideas in, in, in addition to stories? Oh, I was going to say stories. You stole my answer. Um, interesting insights. Act actionable insights. How about that? Oh, analogies and metaphors. and similes. Absolutely. Yeah. Analogies, metaphors, similes. And by the way, as Nick and I were chatting yesterday, I said, I can never remember how to tell the difference between these, but I do understand how to use them. So for example, in great demo meth methodology, 
we say do the last thing first. Okay, that's a recommendation. It's it's a principle. <clears throat> However, by itself, it's flat. It's unsupported. It's boring. Conversely, how many of you folks in the audience have ever seen a cooking show on YouTube, on that thing called TV, on any any entertainment device? How many of you have ever seen a cooking show? I'm Type binging yes Master or... Chef as we speak. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so everybody's seen cooking shows, absolutely. How many of these cooking shows start off with Triple D? Start off with something like, let me show you how to peel and chop the onions. How many have ever seen a show start like that? And the answer is none, nobody starts like that. How do they start? Yeah, you start by showing the end deliverable, the plated, delicious, fabulous, Boy, that actually really looks good, even at breakfast time. The fabulous yeah, food. Good. Cooking shows have learned that you do the last thing first. That's the analogy we can apply to the world of demos. Thoughts, comments, observations. Okay, so we want to demo like Gordon Ramsay. I'm down. I like it. Go yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Flaming skewers. So well, what's okay, better? But, yeah. Well, but Peter, this sounds good, right? But actually... Take me through that. So, so how would you do that? You're demoing a product. Let's say you're, you're demoing your product right now. How do you start with this? How do you show this off? So th that's an excellent question. So what one needs to do is to have a, a mini catalog in your brain of good analogies or metaphors you can use. So when somebody's saying, <clears throat> um, it takes me forever to get something done, you've learned this discovery, um, you can... A, a, you can equate that, for example, or equate it with friction, for example. So it's like, it sounds like you, your job of producing your uh, invoice today sounds like grinding, if you will, your hand over a sand, big grit sandpaper surface. It's very painful, it's slow, there's lots of things in the way. That's, a, that's an analogy method of communicating something more strongly than simply saying, I understand you have a problem with your invoicing process. And by the way, that like, just, I, have no, I have no idea if that's any good. It just popped into my mind. No, but you did a great job painting the picture. I can see the, the, everything being slowed, sl slowed down by the grit of the sandpaper, like literally, you know, you're, uh, yeah, it was great. Okay. And, then, and then the, you know, the rescue is with our software, it's going to be like silk surface. It's going to be smooth. It's going to be comfortable. And it'll actually feel good along the way. Greased rails. Love it. Greased rails. So that's, that's metaphors and analogies. Questions, comments, observations from the audience? All right, let's talk about stories, Peter. Let's talk about stories, yeah. So let's talk about stories. So this was your question. Yes, this was my question, using <laughs> stories to support pain points. He was surprised. And, and expertise. <laughs> Sorry, I was pulling up my notes. So. About drawing analogies, metaphors, and similes, how do you wrap that and make it into a compelling story? So you're giving us the ingredients now, but how do you actually sit down and put this all together to support the pain points and solutions? So, and that is the essence. So the, the stories are really, you use the phrase, we are wired for stories, which by the way, yep. I think appears later in this presentation, unbeknownst to, to Nick, um, it's the same phrase. But stories are really interesting in that they can, encapsulate a key idea that is otherwise often very boring or weak, and they can make it live for centuries. Would you like an example? I would love an example, Peter. So what's this story? A tortoise and a hare. A tortoise and a hare, okay. And uh, just very simply, what happens in this story? The tortoise uh, outperforms the hare because he's uh, you know, an SDR who's making his dials, following his process making sure everything happens. And the hair is the AE who's uh, kind of in and out a little bit. There you go. By the way, there's the analogy metaphor happening right there. And Regina <laughs> just, just noted the moral of the story, slow and steady wins the race. Now, uh, two questions. Uh, who collected this story and when? And anybody from the audience can answer as well as Nick. Who collected this story and when? What do you mean by collected, Peter? Well, who, who wrote this story down the first time? Uh, yeah. Okay. Simon's got it. Simon's got it. Aesop. Now, when did Aesop live? Any guesses from the audience? I always love asking this. Aesop lived when? I'll give you a hint. 
It was a sunny day in ancient Greece. <laughs> Aesop first collected these fables, the Aesop's fables, there's something like, I don't know, 78 or 100 of them, 2,600 years ago. 2,600 years ago, this story first surfaced. And it has been in pretty much every culture that ever got exposed to it ever since then. Interestingly, and Martin from Germany will attest to this, the animals will change. But the story elements right. and the moral, the slow and steady wins the race, um, those have continued for 2,600 years. Now, but wait, there's more. The idea, the meme in this story, slow and steady wins the race, is that an exciting meme? No. No. <laughs> it's boring, right? My son or daughter, if you just persevere and work hard, you will do well. That's, that's the message of this story. You know, fit in. Don't, uh, don't be, uh, don't raise up and you're gonna do well. Well, one of the wonderful things about stories is that a well-crafted, well-told story takes that meme and enables it to live a boring, otherwise unsupported meme, in this case for 2,600 years. So this is how we can begin to use stories uh, in our demos, in our sales conversations, in our customer success conversations. So this then raises the issue of, well, what makes a story great? How many of you guys are familiar with the book that you see here, Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath? Yeah, this is, I think this is the, um, this is the textbook on storytelling. They, they asked the question, why, what, why are some things sticky and some aren't? And what they answered is what you see here on the left. A great story has these five storytelling attributes. It's a simple message, it's based on an experience that's real. There's often a twist, there's an element of surprise. It often evokes a, a strong emotion, and of course, it's got to be relevant. So, you so can, Peter, yeah, let me, let me yeah. ask you sorry, I'm hijacking yeah. here. Let me ask no. you of those five, which do you think is the most critical? Because I know I have one. I don't know that, um, to me, it's a blend. What do you think? I'm with you that it's a blend, but if I have to highlight one, it's evoking emotion. Because if you can strike a chord, an emotional chord with someone, you're going to get a higher level of engagement. And even if you overcomplicate your message, and even if you don't have elements of surprise, if you can really pull emotion in and evoke emotion, in my humble opinion, um, well, there you go. okay, so you're, you're going element of surprise here? I think these two often go together. Okay. When you tell when you tell um, when you tell horror stories, which we'll come to in a minute here, when you tell yeah. horror stories, often what you what you get is the combination of the element of surprise drives the emotional response, like the a the gasp. It's the uh, it's like the I love telling this story. I call the snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> and there's a moment in that story where everybody always goes. <gasps> because it's, it's a surprise and the flip, if you will, at the same time. But I agree, if you don't have a strong emotional uh, connection, it's gonna, it's gonna fall more flat, if you will, than it would otherwise. I'm just saying it's like cooking. If I evoke a lot of emotion when I'm doing a demo, it's like adding, making sure I had enough garlic. You add enough garlic, you solve a lot of problems. <laughs> Can't, nobody can argue with that. Garlic, garlic may well, there will be people, but I believe garlic makes it good. So, <laughs> What makes, what makes a story great? Um, you, you know, many people will say, you'll know a great story when you hear one because you will be able to repeat it with high fidelity and high accuracy and it will engage people it will, and entertain right. them and to a certain degree, it compels them to make a change, make it, make it to do something in many cases. Um, that's what storytelling is really all about. So when you think about this- I'm gonna tie it back to this story now. You betcha. So is it a simple message? Very. Uh, is it a real exp experience? Eh, it's something people can certainly relate to. Is I there, think so. Every, everyone's been through an experience like that to some degree, yeah. I'd say. Is there an element of surprise? Yeah, if you hadn't heard the story before, you didn't. You would just assume that the hare is going to smoke the turtle. Yeah. <laughs> smoke the turtle. How scary. Yes, absolutely. It's very, Does very it popular in Grand Cayman, actually. There you go. Does it evoke an emotional response? Yes, it does. It's about winning and losing, right? And about like, what, what, is, what is the hair feeling post race of everything I messed up because I, I, I took, I went I to took sleep, I took a nap. I went to sleep. Yeah. 
And is it relevant? Well, in theory, yes. It's, this is a life, uh, you know, life principle story, so it's highly relevant. So what makes a good story great or what makes a story great? Um, I think it, it can be broken down <clears throat> to a little bit of a science in addition to, if you will, the art of storytelling. And actually, I want to change and ask Nick something because Nick, Nick, I would say, um, has what I would call a Hemingway aspect of storytelling. And maybe you can explain this best. I think, you know, where I came from in a very B2C environment, we had to tell like really vivid stories. And if I was selling a Swiss watch, I had 15 different brands of Swiss watches that I had to sell, but they're all Swiss watches. They're all 200, 300 year old family owned companies. How do you make them different? And for us, it was really by creating vivid imagery. <clears throat> So interestingly, I was just was just reading an article in National Geographic. Yeah, I actually read the paper version of National Geographic because I like, interestingly enough, the feel. And the article was on touch and feel. And interesting. Actually, this is a um, pick up your water bottle for a second. Close your eyes. Pick up your water yep. bottle um, and describe. And with the other hand, feel the surface and describe it. I can feel the demo stack logo <laughs> there, yeah, there you slightly, go. slightly above the bottle and I can feel uh -huh. there's a divot on the bottom and then I feel the, uh, the screw top on top. And the screw top on top. Um, the texture, how would you describe the texture of the bottle? A 10 grit sandpaper, almost smooth, but, there's, sand. almost but there's, smooth. A little, there's a little bit of pull on it. And how would you describe the curves? Feel the curves. How would you describe them? Are they sharp? Are they rounded? Are they smooth? I would say they're rounded, but not Coca-Cola bottle-esque rounded. There you go. So they, and then the liquid, we could go into that, how that feels and tastes, et cetera. But <clears throat> this is another element of storytelling that I think contributes to success is having uh, sufficient detail, building up the vivid imagery, as Nick said, um, being a Hemingway. You know, fishing that stream, it's not just a green <clears throat> uh, field that the stream is flowing through, but the feel of the air palpably fresh and the mist from the stream, the stream coming up. Um, you know, the green is not just green, there are shades of green, there are textures of green, there are plants yes. that are thick and, and thin and so forth. Building Speaking up that language. imagery. Hey, doing my best. He's, he trained me on this one, by the way. So... With that, well, here's one of the things, this is where I was getting, because this is one of the things you trained me on. And one of the things I learned when we did the 30 day tour in the month of June, mm -hmm. by the way, if you want to see some of that great content with Peter and others, it's on the uh, demo stack LinkedIn page, um, was how critical discovery was to better storytelling. So and what did you, let's, what'd you learn? I learned that I, I really didn't have, I didn't fully understand how asking great questions. Well, I, I knew it on a subconscious level, but I felt hanging out with you and others really made me aware to how I would take what I learned in discovery to better lay out a, a story. Perfect. So let me, let's, uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna leverage this. So imagine that you are a prospect and you've asked to okay. see a demo <clears throat> yep. and, and the, uh, the vendor never asked you anything other than, um, are you the uh, decision maker? Uh, do you have a defined set of needs? Uh, do you have a timeline and do you have a budget? Okay, so they said, great, we'll show you a demo. So now they're showing you a demo and you're seeing things and you're hearing stories that aren't really resonating. Whoopsie, aren't really, uh, I did this wrong, that aren't really resonating. How would you feel about that? I, well, it's not relevant to me. It's not tailored to me. It's like Absolutely. buying a, a suit off the rack. Yeah, and if it doesn't fit, you're not going to buy, right? They didn't even inquire about, did you want a suit? Did you want something else? Do you have specific colors? Do you have just the specific fabrics or textures you're looking for? By the way, so the answer to the question, how great discovery leads to better storytelling, it's mandatory. How can you assemble or uh, deploy stories, if you will? How can you use stories and make them relevant and resonate if you have no clue as to what your prospect is interested in what they need. And by the way, I want to do a teaser. How many know what this is? Looks like a book called Doing Discovery written by Peter Cohen. And it's going to be released hopefully next month. So there's a teaser for those of you who might be interested, yeah, who might be interested in a structured approach to doing discovery. So that's the hint. Can I pre-buy? Pardon me? Can I pre-buy the book? 
Um, you should be able to shortly. I'm working through all the, the Amazon Kindle stuff to make this happen. Here's something I'm curious about. Why do we love horror stories? And I don't know the answer to this question. What do you think? There will be an audiobook version, uh, and I'm going to voice it. Yes, there will. Just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> so why do we I love don't know. horror I don't, stories? I don't, I, don't, I don't love horror stories, Peter. I mean, I don't, for me, I don't enjoy watching other people in pain. <laughs> well, it's, it's, yeah, I don't watch, enjoy watching other people in pain, but, but I do find that people love stories that they can learn from, stories to avoid something that, that has taken place. Would, would you like an example of a horror story? I would love an example of a horror story. Audi audience, give me a yes or no. Audience, chat dialogue box. Would you guys like an example of a horror story? Okay, yes. <laughs> see, see, notice the, the, uh, the capitals and the exclamation points. Okay, so this horror story is about buying it back, buying it back. So told to me by uh, Tim Lozer, who was a terrific guy, sadly just passed away recently, but he had read Great Demo Book and was applying many of the principles, <clears throat> and in particular, the do the last thing first idea. And he had been invited to do a demo for a small company and the CEO was, was right there in the room. He begins this demo with something that was perfectly aligned to what that CEO wanted. And within about six minutes of that demo, the CEO takes out of his wallet a credit card and slides it across the table to my friend, Tim. Tim is delighted, he's excited. He's like, all right, I've already made the sale. And he keeps talking. He says, oh, if you like that, let me show you this, let me show you this other thing, 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 and this other thing. And after about 20 minutes of that, guess what happened? Card got slid back across the table. The CEO reached out and took the card back across the table. Why do you think he took that card back from, uh, from poor Tim? Because uh, Tim had already made the sale and Tim kept talking. Yeah, he basically showed so much that the CEO began to say, no, this is more than we need. It looks complicated. It looks confusing. It looks difficult. I don't think this is for us. And he... What Tim did is he bought it back. That's called buying it back by showing capabilities that the prospect does not need. The, um, the ancient sales methodology of solution selling has a beautiful phrase, stop selling when the customer is ready to buy. <laughs> right, that's so now, a good point. So, so now, what did we enjoy about the horror story? Uh, it was creepy. I had a sale in my hand. I had the PO in my hand and it got pulled out. And, pa and Paige just said it. The lesson. The lesson. We can learn from horror stories from others. Yeah, it happened to someone else. Thank God it didn't happen to me. Thank God it didn't happen right. to you. It right. happened to someone else, and therefore we can learn from it. And that's what makes horror stories so compelling. By the way, horror stories is my name for these. I, you could call these um, you know, experiences, lessons learned. Uh, I learned about sales from that, whatever you want, or I learned about demoing from that, whatever you want to call them. But they're experiences that can be shared to teach us what not to do. And that's a very effective form of story. Okay, I have many, before we move on, I have many questions. By the way, if you do have questions, drop them into the chat or the Q&A. We're happy to answer them. We're here to answer them. What happens, Peter? How do you handle this? I mean, we live in, a, in an era with a lot of product-led growth. And, you know, I was actually reading a LinkedIn post by someone yesterday that got a, a ton of comments and, and interaction. What happens when someone just wants to go to the demo? When someone has done their own research and, they, and you don't have the opportunity to, discover, to do discovery, at least the way you would want to? How do you handle that? So you, are you talking about a, a live human-delivered demo or a... Yes. An auto, okay. Um, I'm going to introduce this in the form of an analogy. Um, have you ever seen a Japanese restaurant that has the models, the plastic models of the sushi and the teppanyaki and the dishes yes. outside the front? What are they doing? What are they doing with those models? Product-led growth. <laughs> Product-led growth. They are. They are. They're generating a vision in the prospect's mind of the, the dining mind of what's possible. The same principle applies or can apply to the fabulous world of demos. They're called vision generation demos. 
And the very simple idea behind a vision generation demo is to, is to enable the prospect to get a very rapid, high level understanding of what's possible in a very few minutes. So one or two or three key screens for that particular job title is a vision generation demo. And the vision generation demo then can drive a productive discovery conversation. So same thing, you're out in front of that Japanese uh, restaurant, you're looking at those dishes, some of them look pretty good. What do you do next if you're hungry? I go in and I actually order the real thing. I either order the real thing or you look at the menu and you say, oh, wow, there's some other things here that look interesting. And then you end up ordering, um, I don't know, some, some beautifully sober and you enjoy it. And the reason is you had a vision generation experience that made you say, you know what, this looks interesting. I wanna learn more. You went in um, perhaps, well, the menu effectively is a mechanism of doing self-discovery. Perhaps you asked the waiter some questions, the waiter asked you some questions. And as a result of that, then you had, if you will, a technical proof demo, which was the final dish that you actually had. There's your analogy. I like that, well done. Okay, I have many more questions, Peter, before we move on, because, oh, sorry, we moved on. See? Oops, sorry, I'm back. There we go. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. (laughs) Well, there's a couple of things that I wanna talk about, like when you do have a, a demo disaster, like what is the best way, in your opinion, to rebound, when you do make a mistake or flub, I mean, those are the real horror stories for me. Oh, sorry. See, I, I was no, in the horror right. story we're, mind we're, frame. We're going to bounce around. It's all right. Okay. So how to, how to rebound from a demo disaster? Well, this is the image I was looking for earlier. <laughs> so I just had an experience two days ago where I had, a, I had a demo disaster. I was doing a webinar, and for whatever reason on my Mac, all of a sudden it said no. Effectively, literally said, no, I don't recognize your mouse, your keyboard, or your AirPods. Um, All of your devices are no longer connected. And by the way, I think the network connection died for a moment as well. So what do you do? What should I have done at that point? Any suggestions? Audience, any ideas? Well, you should have checked everything in advance. Well, I did. I did. (laughs) Okay, okay, okay. This is this. Well, first of first of all, what I should have done is I said, yes, yeah, so you're going through a tunnel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely correct. I had, I had, well, I had, I came up with several answers. Some of them I already knew the answers to. And one was a humorous thing that would have been something like, um, looks like we've had a disturbance in the force, you know, that kind of thing, <laughs> just to let the audience come along. Um, Simon said, ignore the computer and just talk. Yeah. Um, just acknowledge that you've had a problem and jump over it while you fix things as as possible. Uh, You get things organized. It's perfectly reasonable to say, hey folks, we just had a problem with the software. Give me a minute to get things organized and we'll come right back to this. In this particular webinar situation, what I should have done and forgot to do was to say to the host, hey host, uh, looks like I've had a glitch here with the computer. Could you please uh, bring up some of the questions and let's try to address some of those as I get my laptop back under control. So as the, um, and I wanted to have this slide. Um, what is the, um, what's on the cover of the, uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe? What are those warm? Don't panic. Thank you, Simon. Don't panic. That's what I should have had is an image that says in soft, warm, comforting letters, don't panic, just proceed along. And you can even use stories in in some cases to address what happened and make it a little bit of a fun joke. It's a horror story self-made. So there you go, don't panic. I'm gonna offer again, however, one of the best ways to avoid horror stories and problems occurring in your demo is to do discovery. I mean, that's just, that's just fundamental. Yeah, but what happens, right. Peter, when, when you do discovery and then ignore everything you learned that just feature dump anyway? Because I've seen that. I've been on both sides of that. Oh, man. How did that make you feel? You were the prospect, correct? Yeah. Let's ask this to the audience. Audience, have you ever been the prospect, had somebody invest time with you and you invest time with them to do discovery and they totally ignored it in the demo? How did that make you feel? Let's see what people say. How did that make why, you feel? Why did I take time to sit down for this discovery conversation? You wasted my time. You haven't answered my questions. 
and I'm going to shut off my frontal lobe. I'm no longer going to pay attention to anything you're saying. Exactly. So that's probably one of the worst things you can do. And sadly, I see it rather frequently. A uh, salesperson, BDR, a pre-salesperson goes through, does discovery with a prospect, and then they show the same old demo they always show. Day in the life. Let me show you how to set up this. Let me show you how to set up that. Let's progress through the workflow. They totally ignore discovery information with the, with the sole or two exceptions of, and I think you said you wanted to see blah, 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 as they hit it in their standard pathway. So that's, that's a big no. <laughs> How do you catch yourself if you are doing that, Peter? If you don't have someone who's, who's watching your, your gong recordings of your conversations? Self-coaching, man, that is, that is a- Bingo, support. bingo, bingo. There yeah, self-coaching. You've got to get out of your brain and really be a coach. This is a tough thing to do. Um, why do we have coaches? Well, it, here's my argument, Peter. I'm gonna cut you off for a second, if I may. You know. I always say I've never relied on anyone above me in any sales role to teach me. You know, I'll, I'll take, I'll listen, I'll pay very close attention to what they're saying, but I always felt I was responsible for my own development. And one of the things when I started coaching people on doing demos a couple of years ago, um, they weren't even recording themselves. And I said, how, how are you able to go back and watch what you did? So my, the way that I explain this is I watch all, I would watch all my own demos. The first five or six are very uncomfortable but then you start to catch those things and you start to self-coach the word you just said. You start to find your negative words, your crutch words, or you, your you know, take the discovery. <clears throat> exactly. And that comes from self-coaching. And if you do, if you get to 10, if you sit through 10 of those, do one a week, two a week, you will get so good so quickly. You will be so much better at presenting. And if you have an engaged and excited person on the other end and you pull them into your story, they're more likely have great deal of velocity throughout the entire sales cycle. So I'm going to have an opinion on that, Peter. I can tell. So here's a scary thought. Michael Jordan famously said, you can practice uh, eight hours or 10 hours a day, but if you practice 10 hours a day doing the wrong thing, you're going to get really good at being bad. I think I'm paraphrasing this. So right. self-coaching is part one, but you also need to have a mentor, a third party, somebody else who can look at what you're doing and say, hey, did you know there's another way to do this? Or, hey, did you know that there's this way to do something you've never actually experienced? That's what coaches do is they bring <clears throat> a, a fresh perspective, a new opinion. They take you off of the summit of Mount Stupid, <laughs> back into the <laughs> valley of despair, and they, they continue. You guys know that. This is... Um, this is, if you will, level, this is your, your knowledge. Sorry, that's your confidence. This, is, this axis is confidence. This axis is uh, your knowledge, if you will, about something. And Dunning-Kruger identified that you, you can quickly reach what they call the top of Mount Stupid, where you've learned a little bit of information, but your confidence is supremely high. They call that Mount Stupid, and you fall off of this when you realize that, oh, no, there's a lot more I didn't really understand, and right. this is where you continue learning. Uh, avoid this, seek this, and that's what coaching, so self-coaching, and this is a trap, self-coaching can only take you to there. Typically speaking, you need someone else to move you along this part of the pathway because you simply won't gain the knowledge, typically speaking, by yourself. Now, that's, a, uh, that's partially an unfair statement because there's so many resources out there that you can read, you can expand your own mind yeah. and so forth. But just as a general I, principle, this is something to keep in mind. I've got a, I've got a, I'll wait till story time, Peter, but I've got a story about this. All right. We're going to run, we're uh, 40 minutes into this. We're going to run an experiment, all right? We're going to see how Nick did. So, okay. Nick, yeah. you read that story earlier. I did. Yeah, retell it as best you remember. So I was uh, riding my bike. I fell off and I bloodied myself. My bike looked pretty good. Uh, didn't seem to be any issue. And someone came by to help, which was very nice. And I was very appreciative. 
and they offered me uh, first a some food and I wasn't hungry, I was bleeding. And then they offered me a tire patch and my tire was fine because my, as I mentioned, my bike was fine. I was bleeding. Then they offered me, and that's, that's where I, not, that's where I'm losing the story. Keep going, you're doing good. What I, need, what I needed was some bandages and some Advil, uh, dancing, Ryan, dancing girls. And guys. Dancing, dancing girls and, and guys. guys. <laughs> yeah. Water. I didn't need water, although I was a little parched. Okay. Maybe the water was, you know, courtesy. How'd I do? So, and this is the power of stories. Ladies and gentlemen, he retold that story. He'd never seen it before. We did not rehearse this at all. He re retold that story with probably 80% accuracy. He has the entire storyline, the flow, the little twist, the surprise. This is the power of storytelling. Now, here's the question for you and the audience. What was the takeaway message? It was on the title of that slide. Who remembers what it was? Who can remember what that message was? Oh, storytelling capabilities. You're close. Anybody remember? Specific capabilities. Regina, thank you. Yeah, they remember it. So it's the specific capabilities somebody needs. That's the idea behind that story. If you don't remember the idea of specific capabilities, it's fine because the takeaway meme from that story is what you remembered. And right. that's the power of story. So there's the, there's the story uh, again. He did really, really well. I did really okay. Quite, yeah, yeah, no, you did really, really well. Um, and it's not at all unusual. I mean, that's, that's the moral of this thing. We are, as it says, we are wired what? for stories. 100%. So there you go. I want to tell a story, Peter. Is it story time? It's story time, man. Okay, so this is a true story. I, again, I really believe in self-coaching. And this came from my, my background on cruise ships where I had people like off the coast of Japan on a ship, VHS tapes a week late on their actual presentation. I needed them to watch their own tapes. So I, about a year and a half ago, started selling a product and it was a startup. I was the only one selling. It was going from a, a founder-led sale to me being the first sales hire. And what happened was I put out on LinkedIn, uh, I am going to do my demo. Who wants to come and watch me make a fool of myself? I had 40 people show up to sit and watch me do it. Like my first demo before I actually presented it to any prospects, it was terrifying. <laughs> but after I did that, I learned a couple things. One, it's great if you have peers at work that can listen to your product demo, but it's even better if you have people who also do demos, also AEs, sales engineers, who can sit in but sell different products. One, I realized right away, having the different uh, perspectives was great. The other thing I realized, about 70% of what they gave me was actually useful and things I could do or I could take, because I was confident enough in, in my presentation skills and how I demoed. 30% was just, okay, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. But I'll tell you, after you have 40 people who are somewhat internet strangers on LinkedIn, sit in and watch your demo and you're exposed having never done this before, it makes you 10 foot tall and bulletproof. So, you know, getting <laughs> yeah. out there and actually doing your demo in front of people, mm -hmm. even if it's just peers, but practice, you know, off, offline, do practice and practice. And, and yes, your Michael Jordan analogy from before is apt and I get that, but still, even if you're practicing the wrongs, at least get out and practice and then learn what the right things are. So with, with that in mind, what are good stories? And here's some suggestions, business stories that we can use to support some of our ideas and demos, customer success stories, the single most valuable element, use cases, customer success stories. How are they used? You're doing a demo and you reach a point and you say, you know what? We have another customer that was in exactly the same situation you outlined at our discovery call. They were suffering from this, da, 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 da. As a result of making the change, they became blah, 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 blah. And everybody lived happily ever after. <laughs> These are situations where the customer is a hero or the software is a hero or a combination of them. Actually, curiosity question. How many of you guys are familiar with the, uh, the classic uh, North American hero story, the, the 12 step hero story. Type yes or no or hero or 12. Let's see if anybody's familiar with this. Yeah, no, okay. Well, I, I'd suggest you look it up. We're not gonna talk about it today, but the classic American hero story is, is a formula that you'll see in 
all the Marvel all, movies. <laughs> yep, yep. And on and on and on. And it can be actually condensed. You don't have to have all 12 elements. You can have about four of them. Um, and they make their, their success stories. So customer success stories are fabulous. Horror stories, because they teach us what not to do. And of course, as Nick just related, anything that resonated that was a deep personal experience becomes a very, very valuable, whoops, very, very valuable story. So there you go. Love it. Hey, Peter, you know, if you really want to help tell better stories after you've done great discovery, I'm just going to suggest DemoStack, by the way. So you can just go to DemoStack.com, get a quick demo. Uh, Ryan go. will help you out. Ryan's here from our team. Ryan will help you out. Tell him Nick sent you. Absolutely. So to do a little quick summary, memorable demos. What we're talking about is making things remarkable, making them engaging, making them compelling, making them memorable in a positive way. Well, facts are boring. And this is what yep. most people send, tend to do in demos. Let me show you how to blah, 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 day in the life, brush my teeth. Analogies and metaphors can really improve delivery and retention. But man, tell me a story and I will remember it forever. 2,600 years for the rabbit or the, uh, the tortoise and the hare. See, I've changed the animal. So ladies and gentlemen, anything else we want to add to this, Nick? Um, no, this was, this was great, Peter. I really enjoyed this. Um, but I'll come back to it too. Discovery. It's all about discovery. Asking great questions. It's, it's, like, it's, it's almost like there was a book coming out, Peter, soon about this that I feel <laughs> I need to get an advance, a signed advanced copy of. I will, I will do my best. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like a copy of the, uh, the slides, uh, you, can, you can reach me here. Send me an email. Um, you can take a look at the resources we have on our website. And I urge you, of course, to take a look at DemoStack. It's a fabulous team. Take a look at uh, and a listen to what Nick was doing on his roadshow. Where, does, where can they find that? I'm dropping the uh, DemoStack LinkedIn page right now into the chat. Where I was. Voila. There we go. Voila. So that's the Voila. DemoStack LinkedIn page. So a couple things are happening. One is we're, we're really doubling down on content, great content like with, with Mr. Cohen here. Um, so if you are want to get better demos, if you want to, if you're a sales engineer, if you're an AE, definitely follow the demo stack LinkedIn page. And then really, if you want to be able to spin up a tailored demo environment, literally in minutes, like quicker than it takes to make a cup of coffee, demo stack <laughs> is an incredible solution. It really is. I mean, I've, I've seen, you know, what's interesting, <laughs> I have to get permission, but I've sat in on gongs. I've just looked at keywords in our gong conversational intelligence tool and listen for people's mind being blown when they're actually shown demo stack. Like I can't, mm -hmm. I'd have to bleep out every second word of what we constantly hear of like, how the bleep did you do that? How, what, uh, it's amazing. This will save me so much time. So I think what's really interesting is like the space and demo stack is just new and people aren't aware of it. So anyway, check out demo stack. I'm not trying to make this a plug for demo stack, but you should, if you are doing demos, you need to use demo stack. Not that I feel strongly about that, Peter. Show, show your shirt again, just so we can we can make sure we know we're we're allegiance live. There you go. My demo stack shirt. I got my demo stack water bottle. You know, we just unwrapped the truck though. If you followed the tour, yeah, we unwrapped the truck. It was a little sad, but it's okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get another tour in the works. Maybe I don't know. And that, ladies and gentlemen, will the beginning of another story. So many thanks for joining us. We hope you found this useful. Uh, if you weren't on this, we will be posting a recording. I don't know when or where, but we will we'll be standing it up uh, as soon as it's ready. We're on it. Peter, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you to everyone who did participate. Uh, definitely check out all Peter's stuff at Great Demo. Like, there's a ton of great resources. Peter is a resource. I was lucky enough to spend five or six hours with him in San Francisco on the tour, which was a lot of fun. Peter, thanks again. Thanks again to everyone. And uh, we'll see you around the internet. Thanks, guys.